Hey guys, this morning I'm out here firing the third in that series from the Ancient Pottery Challenge. And this time I made that member's sheep effigy pot. So let me first take you back a few days and show you how I formed the pot, painted the pot, and then we'll come back, catch up to today, and we'll go through the firing and see how it comes out. They say the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And that's the way it is with a large project like this. It can be daunting, but you have to just get started. In this case, it started with some wild clay that I collected in the desert near my home in Tucson. But I'm not going to show you the clay collecting and processing part. Let's just start with how I started the form. And that is by patting out a slab with this clay. Now I have this big wooden pookie that I got at Target. And I'm going to press it into it just to make a nice, even, smooth, rounded form to start with. But this is not the pookie I'm going to use to make the sheep pot. So I'm really right here just creating a blank, a round, smooth, flat blank. I'm going to actually form it in this wooden dough trough. So I'm using this dry clay to fill up extra space because the dough trough is larger than I want the bottom of the sheep to be. I put some dry clay in there and I'm just spreading it around and kind of measuring and making sure I have the size and roughly the shape of the bottom of the sheep that I want. And then I'm going to use this piece of cotton cloth just to make sure that the clay that I put in it doesn't stick to the dry clay that's in the dough bowl. Uh, and now I'm going to take it out of that original pookie and put it in this dough trough. So this is what I call my taco method, right? I make it a circle, but then I press it up on the sides like you would making a taco shell and trim it off so that it's even. And this way I get a nice oval base to build my pot on. I did the same thing when I made the football pot, if you saw that video. Form it round and then place it into that more narrow opening and cut the excess off. So I just start by rolling a coil and now I'm just gonna coil up uh, the sides of the sheep at this point. And I'm not gonna go very far, I'm actually just creating the base still. And then I'll smooth the bottom before I actually start building the walls up. And because this is a replica, I'm paying extra special attention to the size because I want this to be roughly the size of the original, which is surprisingly large. When I first saw the picture of this little prehistoric sheep pot in a book, I didn't realize just how big it was. And then I looked at the caption and it literally, it is over 13 inches long and over 10 inches high. So it's pretty good size. So I've got the base all formed now. Now I need to flip it out of there and clean up the bottom. So the reason I'm doing it this way is because once I start building on this little sheep, I'm not gonna be able to work on cleaning up that bottom for a long time. So I wanna make sure I get it relatively smooth and even the way I want it before I start adding heads and other appendages onto this thing. Now it really helps to have a good firm clay for this kind of thing. And I'd have one here. This is that old Sonoida Highway Red. But if your clay is soft and a little floppy, it's really not going to do this very well. Especially that flip out and then put it back in thing. And now I'm ready to start coiling in earnest and get the rest of this little sheep's body made. Now as I've pointed out in previous videos, the steps are coil, bond, pinch, that is pinch the walls thinner and higher, scrape the outside, scrape the inside, and repeat as necessary. Now, the first time you try this, you're not gonna get it good. You know, practice is key to all of this. So get in there, practice your coiling, and keep at it, and you're bound to get this figured out eventually. It is not that hard. At this point, I'm starting to think about shaping the neck and the butt of the sheep. So I'm rounding up the butt end of the sheep here, and I'm also kind of flaring out the other end to start forming the neck of the sheep. And so I'm just adding little short coils across the back, one after the other, to kind of build that back in until I get all the way up to the neck. And then once I've got it all filled in all the way up to the neck, I'm ready to just start coiling again up to form the head. And again, paying special attention to the shape I'm trying to create, which, you know, it's not always easy because usually you're just coiling a round object. And in this case, you're trying to make kind of an organic shape. So it is a little different than I'm used to. So you'll notice that adding the coil is pretty much the same as coiling any pot. But when it comes to the pinching part, that's where I really start forming the shape of that head and pulling out the front 
into sort of a beak or a nose, and I'm kind of pulling the back up and in into the back of the head. And once I get up to the head, you'll see that I'm using a process similar to the way I did the back, using little short coils in sections just to kind of fill in and create the shape I'm looking for. Rolling out those coils, cutting them into small bits, and just filling in piece by piece. And careful with the pinching to get the shape I'm looking for. Once you've got the form all shaped, you've got the rim all smoothed out, you can let it sit and kind of firm up for a while before you try adding appendages like the tail and the horns and the legs. And so once I get this rim all smoothed, I'm going to go ahead and let it set for a while and firm up before I move to that next stage. Okay, now that it's firmed up overnight, it's ready to start adding appendages like tails and horns. So once I get the appendage formed and in the right spot, figure out where I want it, and I just wet that spot and then scarify it a little bit because that clay is firmed up, it's kind of starting to dry, and then press it in firmly and then use little bits of damp clay to just fill in the gap. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the horns that I did on the tail. Get it wet, scarify it, get the horn wet, press it in firmly, uh, and then just get little balls of clay and fill in that gap until it's all smooth. And then, of course, work on shaping the horn to the right curvature that I want. That's all there is to it. Now, I can't put the legs on yet because it's not firm enough to pull it out of the pookie. But I am going to scrape the outside any place I can with this deer rib. And that just smooths the surface, just makes it more finished and ready for that slip. So now I need to make sure it dries nice and slowly using this piece of cotton cloth to cover it so it doesn't dry too quickly, especially those appendages because they have more surface area and will dry more quickly. So now after a couple more hours, it's dried up some more and firmed up and it's ready to pull it out of the pookie and work on the bottom. So I have a couple of things to do to the bottom. I need to add the legs, but I also need to scrape it and smooth it. So I've already scraped the upper portion I need to scrape the bottom and I need to do some of that before I put the legs on because uh, you know it's hard to scrape around legs. So first I form the legs making sure they're all the same shape and size so that they're relatively consistent uh, and then I'll go about adding them, attaching them to the body in the same way I did the tail and the horns. So this is a good place to talk about the different stages of drawing. In some ways forming a pot is almost like controlled drawing from the moment you mix up the clay until firing. It's all about those different stages of dryness and the different tasks you have to perform at those different stages of dryness. So for example, I got the body of clay to a certain stage of wetness that I was able to form the pot. But once the pot was formed, I had to let it dry some until it was firm enough to attach the appendages and to scrape it. And now I'm gonna let it dry some more before I get to that next stage. Now, after drying overnight, covered in cotton cloth, it's at the stage of dryness we call leather hard. That's where the clay has roughly the softness of leather. It's no longer plastic. It's no longer easily deformed by being handled. At this stage of dryness, it's ready for stone smoothing. That's just using a smooth stone, wet, so I dip it in water and keep it wet, all over the pot, and that just smooths out the surface. It presses down any chunks of temper that are standing out and leaves you a nice smooth surface that's ready for slip. And speaking of slip, it's time to start getting my slip ready. I'm not gonna use it yet, but I need to start slaking it down because I want it to be nice and smooth by the time I'm ready to apply it. So this is how I store my slip, dry. Uh, and so I'm gonna slake it, but I'm gonna use these pliers to break up this clump first so it'll slake down faster. Uh, and then I'm just gonna add some water and allow it to sit and kind of soak up for a couple of hours. My Zoom pottery class meets every Wednesday night. It's called the Ancient Potters Club, and we get together every Wednesday night via Zoom to make pottery together, to work on a different project. And so it's a great way to learn because you can share information and ask questions from me or from other students who are at different stages of learning, some at your stage, some more advanced. I'll put a link to the Ancient Potters Club down in the doobly-doo in case you're interested in joining us. And so here's my slip, just slowly getting it down to a thin 
smooth, creamy consistency. And as you can see here, it's ready. It's at the right consistency to go on the pot. And so I'm still worried about putting too much pressure on those legs. So I've got it propped up on a rolled up towel here. Now, if you look at the consistency of my slip, uh, you'll see that there are chunks in it. There's little lumps that didn't dissolve. And, and some clays are worse at this than others. Um, it does help sometimes to pass it through a paint strainer to kind of get rid of those lumps. Uh, but in this case, I'm pretty familiar with this clay and I know that any of those lumps that remain on the pot can be dealt with later. So after letting it sit and dry for a while, uh, the slip is now firm enough that it's not going to easily rub off or smear when I set it down. So now I can set the pot on its side and slip the bottom. I also, while it's on its side, gave a second coat to those areas that were upright. And so slowly I'll get it all covered in a couple of coats. And here I'm just trying to be careful about that drying again. Like I said, it's controlled drying all the way through the process. And so what you really have to be aware of is I'm trying to dry the body of the pot out as much as I can. Uh, but those appendages, tails, legs, horns, those are going to dry so much faster because there's so much more surface area on them. And so I'm using some saran wrap to just kind of protect those from drying too fast. It's not very authentic, uh, but it is very effective. So. Okay, now on day four, we're at a much drier stage. We're still technically in the leather hard stage, but we're a lot firmer, a lot drier leather hard, and we're ready to start burnishing or polishing. This is using the same smooth stone that we might have used in the stone smoothing section, but in this case, we're using a dry stone, and that gives the clay a nice smooth, polished surface. And this is also going to deal with those little clumps that were left in our slip when we applied it. Any of those little clumps we'll pay a little extra attention on and we'll just iron those right out with the stone. And then some more controlled drying. In this case, the head was drying out way too fast and so I'm gonna leave it covered in cotton cloth and let the rest of it sit out and dry. Okay, I finally got the little sheep mostly dry. Now you might be looking at it and thinking, why does it have that variegated look? Why are there places that are darker and other places that are lighter? When you polish a pot, sometimes the areas where the clay is more compressed will look darker, and those areas that are less compressed look lighter. And it's especially obvious when it's drying like this, where it's still partially dry and partially damp. And it'll look that way to some extent right up until the firing. And then after the firing, those areas will even out and be all the same shade of white. The other thing to remember is a good part of this pot is gonna be covered in red paint. So if you look at the picture of the original, you'll see that it has a lot of paint on it. So a lot of this white is actually gonna be covered up and only gonna show through in places. So even if there are variegated areas, you will not notice them once it's painted. Now you might be thinking red paint, the paint in this picture looks black or dark brown, but that's the way this is done. So this is a replica of a membrous pot and they were painted with red iron oxide paint and then fired in a reducing atmosphere to turn that paint black. And so that's what I'm gonna to try to do with this. I'm gonna to try to fire it in a reduction atmosphere so that the red paint that I put on it will turn black or at least a dark brown color. Now I'm in a hurry to get this done. Today is Wednesday and I need to get this painted and fired no later than Saturday because on Sunday a winter storm is coming in and I'm not gonna be able to fire after that. And if I don't get it all fired and finished by Saturday, there's no way I'll get that video edited and released by next Wednesday. So I'm kind of in a hurry. I'm not gonna start painting the designs on this pot until tomorrow, but I need to start getting my red paint mixed up so that it's all nice and smooth and ready to use when I need it. So I start out by grinding up this red clay. This is what I call freeway red. I get it next to the interstate freeway. And so I'm just gonna store the ground up red clay in this little baby food jar. And always remember to label these jars because I tell you, I have lost more information about what clay is in what jar. So. Always make sure you label it. Now in this container, I have some old paint from the last project I worked on. And in it, I'm going to put equal parts of the red clay I just ground up and it's also some red hematite, which is red iron oxide. It's just a ground mineral. That's my pigment. And I'm just gonna add some water and then I'm gonna put the lid on it and just let it sit overnight so that hopefully by tomorrow, it's all slaked and smooth and ready to use.
The secret to freehand painting a design like this is to just get your framing lines in place and then it's just a matter of filling in those blocks in between. So it's kind of a monotonous process that requires a lot of thought and patience. So while I'm painting this, let me talk a little bit about that drying process that I talked about earlier. Building a pot like this using primitive methods from beginning to end is just a matter of controlled drying along the way and doing different steps at different stages of dryness. So you start out by preparing your clay and getting it to the desired stage of wetness and then you build your pot. Then you let it dry until it's not quite leather hard. Then you scrape it. Then you let it dry until it is leather hard, a little drier. Then you do the stone smoothing. Then you let it dry a little more. You let it dry to the point where it's still leather hard, but it's not sticky to the touch at all. It's quite firm and solid. And then you slip it. Then you let it dry a little more and then you polish it. And then you preheat it before you fire it to drive off any remaining moisture in the clay. And then you fire it, which gets rid of all the rest of the moisture and you're done. I like to get an early start on firing day because the air is the stillest right at dawn and then it tends to get breezier as the day goes on. So an early morning firing has the least air movement, which is good for your firing. In this case, it turned out to be a little breezier than I would have liked and that allowed the firing to get pretty hot, a, a little hotter than I would have liked. These are just small branches of mesquite wood that I'm firing here and notice that the diameter of the fuel is pretty small. It's all small enough that I didn't even need an axe. I could break all of this with my foot or over my knee. An infrared thermometer is not a primitive tool but it sure is helpful if you're gonna try firing this way. I'll put a link down in the doobly-doo to where you can pick up one like mine for about 50 bucks in case you're interested. Now, if you've watched a few of my firing videos in the past, you've probably seen me try to achieve reduced iron paint. I've made a few videos about it. I'll put some links to those down in the doobly-doo and also one or two up above as well. It's a struggle. It's a struggle to try to smother the pottery and I've tried different ways and had marginal success. So in this case I'm going to try an unauthentic sagger smother. So I've got a big flower pot here and I'm just gonna put it over the top and then put dirt around the sides and over the hole and try to smother the fire. What I'm trying to do is keep oxygen away from the pot as it cools. Those red iron paints which are black now because the fire has been consuming all the oxygen. So those paints will stay black as the pot cools. Okay, this has been in here for over two hours now and the outside is quite cool. good but um, I got quite a hodgepodge of uh, oxidized and reduced areas this uh, this horn got too hot it's it's really weird it's kind of crackly looking definitely got too hot right in this area most of it looks pretty good though all right guys there's my little sheep I think he came out pretty good now I cleaned him up as best I can in the field, but he's still got some ash and stuff on him. So I'm gonna take him home and clean him up better. So if you watch this video all the way to the end, you'll see some photos of a better, more cleaned up version. Now, how does this compare? Uh, I got some areas where the paint oxidized red and other places where it reduced black. And I'm cool with that because that was really common on the ancient members pottery. In fact, I was looking at pictures of members jars recently. Now, most members pottery is bowls. I was looking specifically at members jars and I saw that I couldn't find any that were fully reduced black iron. Most of that paint was either fully oxidized, red, 
or it had kind of a mix of red and black areas, much like what I got here. So I think my firing was on par with what the members were achieving. Now, were they using big pots like that to smother their pottery? Probably not, but I wanna test that out and see how that works and then move into trying to find ways to accomplish the same thing using more primitive techniques. If you don't know what the Ancient Pottery Challenge is, that's that list of seven pots from the ancient Southwest that I've chosen to recreate this season. And you can make the same pots and upload the picture to Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery Challenge. And then everybody can see our work and I'll share them all on this channel when we're done. So this is my member's sheep pot that's part of the Ancient Pottery Challenge. Now that you have the instructions in this video, I look forward to seeing yours on Instagram soon. If you'd like to learn more about the Ancient Pottery Challenge, check out this video over here, where I take a road trip across the Southern Southwest to study these seven different cultures that lived there in prehistoric times and the pottery that they made. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.